Hello, Mr. Kelly. I'm uh, Lucy Damo. I'm a biologist teacher at the local college. Uh, it's nice you're with us here in the, what we can call the lighthouse of the Gulf, this Gulf that we share as a living place and a place that makes our living. And uh, I had the same questions as Mr. Toussaint about the biologists in your board, but uh, I have another one. I felt a bit like an uh, irresponsible parent. I'm not sure if that's what you, you, you wrote or said, but you, you give the okay to the companies to go and make the, all the, the work uh, that they have to do. And after that, if something's happened, it's all the company's resp uh, responsibility. Is that what you said? All the cleaning and everything? Yes. Yeah. So that's like a parent who said you can go, but if something happens, I'm not there after that. Uh, what it says is, uh, before you go out and uh, conduct these operations, you need to assure us that you have the ability to respond to an environmental uh, incident uh, at whatever magnitude that is, and, uh, and in doing so, give us the plans that show you can do that, and then we are going to hold you accountable for doing that if an incident occurs. And if you do not perform up to the requirements that you've committed to, then the board can take over the operation and you will still be financially responsible for that. So it's, it's that kind of a system as opposed to, uh, uh, yes, you can go off and then if you don't do it, uh, you know. So there, there is a, um, a strong emphasis on prevention, uh, but there is also acknowledgement that if an incident happens, there, you know, there's a commitment here to uh, respond effectively and timely to that. Uh, I'm just going back to the uh, question again about the biologist on the board, in terms of the board members themselves, they are appointed by governments, and uh, the board uh, itself, the staff of the board, or the CEO have no role in, in who those people are that get assigned to the board, but they have a policy role within the board, um, and they rely uh, on the staff of the CNLOPB for the information they need to make their decisions. So for each board meeting, uh, there are papers prepared, technical papers and presentations made for the board, and they have an opportunity to ask questions and to, to deal with uh, issues that come up that way. And any matters they don't uh, they don't understand generally the generally the, the, the board will will not make decisions until they fully understand uh, the implications of that. So it's the onus is on us to make sure that the board members who are policy makers within the board, not government policy makers but board policy makers, uh, understand what it is that we're uh, we're describing and um, and uh, and the decisions that they need to make. Yes, but you have both feet in the uh, marine environment. It's uh, really important to have somebody that is with you with these uh, competencies. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a, uh, an issue that uh, you would uh, best be directed towards the government to make those appointments, uh, but, but I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Hi there, Irene Novacek, University of PEI. Um, I have a main question, but before I get to that, you had a slide there and you, you spoke to it. You said that a relief well is required <laughs> on, on all of your operations. Yeah. But in fact, um, according to um, news reports out of Newfoundland recently, uh, your petroleum board is overseeing the deepest well drilling ever, deeper than the one in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, currently in your, under your jurisdiction off Newfoundland. And there is no relief well being drilled in tandem to the main well in that case. And in fact, the, the, the decision has been made that it is excluded. There will not be any requirement for a relief well there. So why do you come here and tell us that every deep water well, every well that you might want exploratory drilling that you might want to do in this well, will be under those terms of a requirement for a relief well, when clearly that is not true. Hmm. Um, no, it is true. Uh, the companies are required in their application to demonstrate for us that they have the capability to drill a relief well and that they have arrangements in place for a rig to be able to drill the relief well if one is required. A relief well is not drilled uh, at the same time as a well for one very good reason and that is you're doubling the risk of an incident because you can have a blowout from a relief well. So well you would risk, never put a relief well into your pressure area until you needed to. You had to know where you're going to be able to start the drilling, you had to know where the target is so if you start here and find out the target somewhere else you, 
it's not practical to be able to do that. So it's, it's not really, it's something that, uh, that they had to be ready to do uh, as soon as possible if an incident occurs, but it's not practical to try to and do giving that. giving something as deep as that offshore well in Newfoundland, how long do you think it would take to drill a there's, relief well? There's no doubt it was that deemed uh, to be it required. would take a long time, that, as it did with BP, that uh, drilling a relief well takes a long time. Uh, and that has been traditionally the way in which this has been done. Uh, it's no different in Newfoundland than it is anywhere else in the world. And I think the challenge here now for the industry is to find better ways to do that. And yet I when you stand up in public and you say that there's a requirement for a relief well, and that's all that was on the slide. Yeah. Then you give the impression to people who are not technical experts that in fact, you know, there's going to be a relief well there that you can swing into motion if there is any sign of a, of a problem. If and you're going to have a relief well, it's nowhere there's near. engineering that needs to go along with the design of that relief well. You're, mm -hmm. you're essentially going to replace this well with this well. That's right. And it has to be developed in accordance with the proper standards and the regulations and the guidelines. So you can do some of that work in advance, but you can't do it at the same time that you're drilling this one. There are perhaps some things you can do uh, initially in terms of putting infrastructure in place if you need to do that. That may be something that boards can look at, but the requirement to drill the same well or to drill a well, even you know, at a, at a different rate, would not be practical under the current regime. So the requirement, yes, it's there, and I don't think you should say that we don't require relief wells. We do require relief wells. But there was some kind of special dispensation no, there was on, that, on that deep block water no, well was because it, it was discussed. No, there was no... In the meeting. From the beginning, well, let me take from the beginning, Chevron was required to be able to tell us that they are going to drill a relief well. They would not have been given an authorization if they could not drill a relief well. And those provisions were in their application. They verified it. They had two rigs that could do it. And that's another important thing is it has to be a rig that can do it. You can't say you can use a rig over here that's not capable of drilling at those depths. Mm -hmm. So they had to identify that specific rig, how long it would take to mobilize to there, and how long it would take to... Demain où vous allez pouvoir débattre de ces questions-là. Alors, euh, non, mais je, je, suis, je suis désolé. Uh, let, let me just say, I'm going to be around until Sunday morning. No, Mr. Mr. Kelly, please. Okay, Alors, je, je vais par, procéder tout de suite. Uh, on a une pause que je vais d'ailleurs raccourcir uh, pour prendre peut-être un café, verre d'eau, 3-4 minutes, et nous allons euh, reprendre avec la conférence de M. Gilles Côté. Merci.